Hello everybody, my name is David. Thank you for joining me for today's Q&A video. So what I'm doing is I'm answering people's questions from last week. I do this every single Monday. Any questions you guys have today, please go down below into the comment section, ask me anything you want, and I'll answer them next week in the next Q&A video. So, uh, I'm sorry, part one got cut off there. I went too far and it cut me off. So uh, I hope you guys understand they come to part two. If you have not watched part one, please watch it. Let's get started right away with people's questions. Next one is from Joanna in London. Hello. And I hope it's Joanna, not Joanna. Uh, or I hope I'm just getting it right. Would you talk more on narcissistic injury? What sort of abuse would one have to suffer to become a narcissist? What triggers narcissistic injury throughout their lives? I experienced a two-year period with a narcissist where he withheld physical affection, piled on a lot of weight. Why? And, and I'm, I shorten people's questions a lot. Um, what stops us codependents and empaths from becoming narcissists? Well, I, I talked a little bit about this in the last one, the very end of part one, when I answered uh, Marty's question. So, for, for one, Doctors don't know exactly what, they, they can't pinpoint exactly what's causing people to form narcissistic personality disorder. They label it as inappropriate parenting. So there's a lot to that, okay? The other factors that are very important though is people, it, it, what causes personality disorders is three things. There's three factors to really know. And it's, it's our brains, right? So our genetics, who we are, and it's the culture we live in, okay? And it's how we were raised, our environment. Those three factors we must consider. Meaning, one narcissist could become a narcissist, right? And a, a person could be raised exactly the same way, exact same parents, exact same place, but they're a different brain. Brains react differently. So this person doesn't become a narcissist. Do you understand? So that is what makes it very difficult to pinpoint it. So you ask what would cause narcissistic injury? Something to understand is the sense of self, of who we are, okay? Narcissists don't have a defined self, an actualized self. So they aren't going to make themselves feel better. They need people to do that. They are all ego. All they care about, who they are, is determined by other people. Completely. What other people see. That's who they are. That's it. So, this is... Um, think of somebody that just, you know, the worst low self-esteem. Feels like the biggest, worst person in the world. And they counter it with ego. They say, I'm not equal like everybody else, so I'm better than everybody else. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. And so it's easy that egos are very easy to, to poke, to damage, to injure. All they care about is what you think. So when another person tells them what they think and it's bad, they can't handle that. I've got another channel smearing me for almost two years, making up all kinds of lies, saying I'm this horrible, horrible person, I'm a predator, I'm all these nasty, nasty things, right? It doesn't bother me. Why? Because I know who I am. It's not determined by that person or anybody. People don't determine who I am. If I didn't, if wasn't very sure of myself and confident who I am and know myself very well, that would bother me, right? Like Shane, I talked about Shane. Shane took his whole life. That's how much it bothered him, right? So think of all the abuse you guys have taken. They can't do that. Think of all the times you picked yourself up, up off the floor when no one else was there for you. They can't do that. They do not do that. They can't say, oh, it's okay. You're a good person. You don't deserve this. No. They can't say, oh, you're going to be okay. You're always okay. You're all right. No. They need people to do that. 
And if you won't do it, they go on to the next. Um, <clears throat> so what could cause a narcissistic injury? Just about anything, man. Just about anything, right? Easy. You, you can see people do this all the time. People with really massive egos and low confidence. Looks like confidence, but it's cockiness. The healthier you become, the easier you can identify the difference. I hope that makes sense. Um, why do they withhold physical affection from you for two years and pile on a ton of weight? Um, th that sounds like depression. It sounds like um, emotional trauma, depression. That's usually what people do. They withdraw, especially men. Men withdraw from their families, isolate, uh, gaining weight, all signs of depression. That answers your question. Thank you. Waves of Alchemister surf something and your name was so long it cut you off. Um, so I don't know what your full name is, sorry. So you have three questions. First, what are emotions? Well, emotions are your body doing things, okay? I think of it as emotion, energy and motion. So um, a lot of people think emotion is sadness. Well, it feels like that, right? But emotion is, you know, the hair standing up on your arms, perspiration on your upper lip. I get a funny feeling in my stomach when I'm around somebody. Uh, you know, you, you see what I mean? And feelings is awareness of what that is. Let's see. This, this, and this is anxiety, is fear, is depression. Those are feelings, right? How does one emotionally project? Well, I'm not exactly sure how someone does that, um, but people project their emotions quite often on other people. People that can't regulate their emotions themselves expect other people to regulate them for them. And they will take the res or push the responsibility onto people around them and say, you made me feel this way, you fix it, stuff like that. Um, you know, people that are not emotionally responsible want you to feel the same they do. They want your emotions, your body to do the same things that they're doing. It's the first signs of codependency, right? Your emotions should be mine. I can't deal with my emotions, you deal with them. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. I'm sorry if I'm not helping. Uh, ask me more specific questions, maybe that'll help. And then your next question is, how does one turn off their desire for a narcissist if they have a killer body and you have to work with them. <laughs> uh, so that's desire that, you know, and then you wanted to know, is it possible you, you've heard someone told you, you've heard somewhere that you can turn off emotions. Well, we try, some people try, a lot of people try. Most people watching this video have tried um, and it doesn't work. Meaning, can you do it? I mean, can you turn off your emotion? Well, we do things to, to try to do that. But, and you may have some success at it, but it won't help you be successful. <laughs> you may be excess, you may have success numbing or suppressing. You say turning off, that sounds like completely, I don't know, I don't like that, but we can suppress, we can numb and ignore some emotions, but we can't turn them off completely. I don't, you know, maybe someone can, but you can have some sex, success doing that, but it won't, it won't bring you in, any success in relationships, your emotional part of your life, things like this. Think of the people that say emotions are, are weak or are, are weakness, right? Those are the people that, that don't handle their emotions very well. People say, oh, empathy is a weakness. So, you know, no, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. How does one turn off their desire for someone else? So let's be focused and be very aware of what you want. You obviously don't want to. You're asking me, how do I turn off my desire for wanting a person? I'm guessing sexually, it's about their body, right? So why don't you start realizing what you really want in life and what's important to you? Is it killer bodies? 
You know, because here you're at a job making money. That must be important to you. What do you want to do with your money? Why don't we have more goals than just pay rent and bills? What else do you want to do with your money? That, that makes jobs pretty mundane, doesn't it? If all you're trying to do is pay your rent and bills, that, and it starts making jobs suck to go to. So why don't you figure out something else you want to do with your money? Start having goals, right? Start focusing on things that are important to you. Because I don't think, I mean, if, if that was important to you, then you don't need to turn it off. So you want to know how to turn it off so it's not important to you, obviously. There's other things that are important to you. I'd start focusing on them, right? Find out who you are, what, what is important to you, what you want in life. If it's not this, right? I hope that makes sense. Good luck. Christian from Sweden, hello. My borderline ex recently going to therapy and prescribed medication for depression. She wants me back. I'm attracted to her and I'm confused. Can medication help these people? So this is what happens when we stay in contact with our abuser, right? We, we get updates. We, we, we keep thinking about them. They stay in our heads. They stay in our mind. They stay in our lives. They stay in our heart. And now, because you said X, this is your X. And, and here they are. Now they're going to therapy and get medication for depression. And you're attracted to her. You're confused. And so we need to really be aware of, of what's going on here, Christian. Why, are, why would you be attracted to her? What are you attracted to, Christian? Instability? Emotional dysregulation? No security? No autonomy? Are these the things you're attracted to? Or is it boobs, butt, hair, sex, excitement? You're confused. I would be too. Sounds confusing. Figure out who you are. Figure out what you want. And make your choices best show that and say that. If you don't want to be abused by someone who has borderline personality disorder, then we do not talk to them anymore. Who cares what they go and do? Who cares if they're in therapy? Who cares if they're taking drugs? I love people. Man, I've heard this so much. I, I, had, I heard someone told me once, uh, well, yeah, she has to be healthy. healthy. She's on antipsychotic medic medication. Oh, well, well, then we know she's not psychotic as long as she's taking the medication. That's great. Let's start there. Or let's just get somebody who's not psychotic without the medication. Okay, let's stick with your question. Can meds help these people? Well, meds are, are meant to help people. If she's a people, then they can, right? That's a pretty general question. Can meds help these people? Can medication help people that have borderline personality disorder? Help them with what? You said that she was dis, uh, diagnosed with depression and the doctor gave her a pill for that. I think that's what you're saying. Can that help with her depression? Well, Help how? Pills don't make depression go away. They numb it. And not all the way. Thank God. So you can still have some emotion left. So here you have someone with a personality disorder who is also depressed. And now she's on drugs. And you think this is a good thing. No. No. I'd rather have somebody in my life that does not have a personality disorder, that is not depressed, and is not on drugs. Just my preference. That's just me. When you start compromising yourself like this, Christian, you lose yourself. It can be confusing. I would suggest, Christian, that you hire a professional to have more clarity to hold you accountable for your choices, to offer better cognition, 
more information, better understanding, and why don't you figure out who you are and what you want? Because <clears throat> I think that'll help you decide what you need to do. Okay? Can meds help her? That's what they're for. They're meant to be temporary so that you deal with your depression. If you can't handle the way you feel, you can take some drugs to numb it, but you better get down to the source. While you're on those drugs and while you're numbing this pain, you might want to fix the problem. Because you take away the drugs, there's the pain again. So how long are you going to take drugs for? Because drugs are bad and good, <laughs> right? Drugs aren't good for us, guys. And I don't care if it's from a doctor or off the street. I, I understand one's better or cleaner or I get that. But we, we shouldn't be taking drugs. How long, are you gonna, how long is she going to take antidepressants for? Rest of her life? 40 years? And why does that compute as a good thing? No, it's not. It's too bad. Thank God we have them. That's, they're, they're for people that need help, that can't handle their own emotion. Depression, they can't handle it. It's too much. I don't know what to do about my depression. I've tried everything. So I'm gonna, I got to take these. I got my last resort. I got to take some drugs to numb it out, man. Numb it out. Numb it out. It doesn't make it go away. It's just temporary. You're just, you're just, you're holding everything on pause. 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 I've been taking antidepressants for a month, two months, three years, five years, 10 years. I know people have been on antidepressants for decades. You, have, you haven't felt your emotion in decades. That's, that's scary, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, going to a therapist and being on medication doesn't make someone healthier, better. They're on the right track, I guess. But we wait and see what happens, right? It's not, oh, I have a therapist now. Cool, everything's better. Nope. Oh, I hired, I hired David as my life coach. I'm all better now. Nope. Oh, I'm taking drugs. Everything's cool. Nope. Those are called problems. Problems. My girlfriend's in therapy. Ooh, what for? Borderline personality disorder and depression. Ooh. And she's having to take massive medication because she can't handle how she feels. Ooh. Yeah, not good. I'm not trying to judge anybody. I'm just saying, Christian, you deserve better than that. I hope you will soon see that. Uh, May. Don't know where you're from? Guys, please leave us your locations. Tell us where you're at. Thank you. May asks, I don't love you anymore. Is that good enough explanation for discard? And I think you're asking me, is telling your partner, I don't love you anymore, good enough for, for closure? Yes, but you're, I, I just want to, just a little bit, you're saying for discard. It, why, why do you need to discard someone? Discard means, uh, you know, right? Discard is, I discard my garbage. Throw it away. No good to me. No more value. It's garbage. I discard it. Right? We don't discard people. Right? So you don't need to discard them. So we're, we're ending the relationship. And you want to give them a, a little bit of a closure and tell them you don't love them anymore. Perfect. Perfect. And what that will do, mate, is help you feel better about who you are and how you treat people. You'll, you're, you'll be... Making your, your moralistic values principle in your life and you'll feel more secure with who you are. More stable, sorry, more stable. You are saving, you are keeping some integrity, some self-respect and respect for other people, even other people that treat you badly. That's awesome. Commendable. And Joanna. Hello, Joanna. Gives a statement. I don't think it was his consciousness denying it. I believe he was gaslighting me so that he wouldn't be exposed. He showed no conscience whatsoever. His actions were never by mistake either. Years of systematic abuse and betrayal are not mistakes. And what I want to just say is it was interesting. Your, your, 
your wordage here is you said, where is it? <clears throat> he showed no conscience whatsoever. I want you to know that means awareness. That's what conscious means, being aware. He showed no awareness whatsoever. I know. Usually people that treat people like this aren't very aware. They aren't very aware of what they're doing is counterproductive. It's not getting what, what they actually want and need. It's the wrong way of doing things. They're not very aware that what they're doing is sick and unhealthy and hurting someone or how much it's hurting them. If they don't, you know, what, what's lacking empathy? Lacking empathy is simply, I'm unaware of how it's making you feel. That's what lacking empathy means, right? I'm unaware. I'm lacking awareness. Personality disorders, lacking awareness. Why don't people with personality disorders go get help? They're unaware that they need it. Everything's about unawareness. Lack of awareness. That's what all this is about. Narcissism, lack of awareness. Why don't they go get it fixed? They don't know that it's a problem. They don't know it's them. They believe it's you, right? Why do they always believe why do they always blame you? They believe it's you. Why are they hurting you? Because you did something to them. Because you lied to them. Because you failed them. Because you hurt them. They're hurting you back. It's revenge. And you're like, I, I didn't hurt you. But you don't realize that, that you maybe you did. I'm not saying... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but anyways, your, your words, he showed no conscience whatsoever. Perfect. I, I agree with you. He's not aware of what he's doing. You said not whatsoever. I, I think he's kind of aware. Just lacking some awareness. I hope that makes sense. Maya or Mia, M-I-A. Um, hi. I've learned that verbal communication with narcissists is not possible. Only small talk, no real interest in other people. Why do narcissists avoid verbal communication? Oh man, awesome, awesome. People with narcissistic personality disorder can be horrible communicators. They can be. I don't need someone to tell me, oh, my narcissist was a great communicator. Typically, it's horrible communication skills. They can be so bad at reading affect that they can be completely socially inept, can't have a conversation at all. I've seen some narcissists that just are just mind blowing. Like I, they're just, I, I feel so sorry for them that they can't even talk. Literally, literally, they just they, they can't have a conversation. You can't sit there and get them to understand anything. Um, you know, all of us. I believe all of us have been emotionally neglected. Us meaning victims of narcissistic abuse. We've all been emotionally neglected in our relationships, in our childhood. It, you, you only have so much time to prepare your children for life. Honestly, honestly. I think you only have four or five years to prepare children for, for life. Because what do you do? We put them in schools, we throw them in society and they're around their peers. Okay, and that's the most important thing in the world is relationships with people. We better prepare them to, to assimilate and associate and, and relate to their peers. And we've got a few years to do that. And how do we do that? Communicating. Communicating. Emotional neglect means lack of communication. And it shows, boy, does it show. And you can be as empathetic as you possibly could imagine. And it doesn't mean you're good at asking for what you want, what you need, telling people how you feel, what you're thinking. I'm sorry. So many victims of this stuff don't communicate very well. I'm just telling you that right now. They're problem, highly problematic in relationships with other people. They don't get along with people very well. And they don't have a personality disorder. They're just victims of emotional neglect as children. And now they're being emotionally neglected in, in relationships. And quite frankly, they may not know how to ask for anything they want anyways or need. They Emotionally neglected, you got to at least be able to you know, kind of ask for the things that you need, right? You can't just expect people to just be there for you and do everything for you. You got to be able to communicate. And if your parents didn't communicate with you very well, well, you're going to have problems reading affect. You're going to have problems asking for what you want, being in tune with other people, emotionally connecting with people and relationships. You're going to have major problems. And look, we have major problems. We're having major problems with relationships, with people. We're having problems communicating. 
We need to talk to our children, guys. Talk to your children. And don't just tell them what to do. Ask them how they feel. Please. They don't need to be told what to do all the time. Right? We can't just keep them safe all the time. Let them make mistakes. Let them make mistakes and let them process how it feels so they learn from it and don't do them again. That simple. It should be that simple. It's kind of that simple for a lot of people, I think. Start making it more simple for you and doing that. Do that. Be okay with making mistakes. Let's not make, you know, keep making the same mistakes by learning. And how do we learn? We learn how it feels. I can't tell you enough how many people hurt themselves over and over and over again by doing something they know hurts them over and over and over again. And they don't know how to make themselves feel better when it hurts. It's like, man, we, we've been doing this your whole life. You know what makes you feel good, but you forgot. You know this hurts you, but you keep doing it. We need to be cognitively aware of how we feel about things. Not just what we're supposed to do. Right? Hope that makes sense for everybody. Because all I'm trying to do is help you guys understand. So you feel better, not make the same mistakes. That's it, guys. Thank you, all of you, very, very, very much. Great questions, great support, great help. Thanks for being there for each other, everybody. Thanks for great recommendations, great questions, all of you. Um, please, love yourself first. Love yourself before you love anybody else, okay? Have a relationship with yourself before you have a relationship with anybody else. Know who you are. Know what you want. Know what's important to you. And have people in your life with similar Similar things that are important to them. Similar morals and values. Thanks, guys. Love yourself first. I'll see you next Monday. Okay, have a good week. Bye-bye.